Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the special live broadcast hosted by the Marina Institute and coming to you from Galway along Ireland's rugged west coast. Uh, we are here today in celebration of World Ocean Day and the, our Oceans of Learning campaign are broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube. So I encourage you to get involved if you can, add any comments and questions using the hashtags o World Ocean Day and Oceans of Learning from wh whatever platform you're on. My name is David O'Sullivan. I work in the Marine Institute in Advanced Mapping Services, and I'm also part of the Inframar team, which is Ireland's National Seabed Mapping Programme. Thank you very much for joining us today from wherever you are. Maybe you are on dry land, maybe you are in a foreign land, or maybe you are all at sea. Either way, you're very welcome. Um, I'm shortly going to introduce some of my colleagues to discuss the life of a, of a marine scientist. But first, just a little background on the Marine Institute. So we are the national agency responsible for marine research, technology development and innovation in Ireland, providing scientific and technical advice to the government. Uh, we also manage the operations of Ireland's marine research vessels, the RV Celtic Explorer, the RV Voyager. And this year is especially year as the RV Tom Cream is expected to join the team in just a few short weeks, actually. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, many of our scientists work at sea on these vessels on various research surveys. You know, they can be hydrographic, fisheries, ocean climate, monitoring or exploratory surveys, and they all require slightly different operations and skills. So today uh, for World Oceans Day, we're going to chat with some of those scientists, find out what it's like to be on those vessels, what they like or indeed what they don't like. Um, so I hope you can stay with us for the next 25 minutes or so. And as I said, please get involved if you can. Hashtag World Oceans Day. So if I can organize the technology, I'm going to add in our scientists now. Most welcome. Hi, everybody. You're all still muted. That's perfect. So in no particular order, just in the order you're seeing on my screen, we have Dave Stokes, who's a fishery scientist here in the Marine Institute. We have Caroline Cusick, who is a biological oceanographer. And we have Claire Moore, who is another fishery scientist. Uh, hi, guys. Thanks very much. How are you all doing? Great. Thanks. Good. Good. Good morning. You are very welcome. So I'll start maybe by just asking you, and again, I'll just go by the top order I see in your screens. That's you, Dave, first. Um, maybe tell us about uh, your own backstory or what your current role involves. Um, I'm uh, working here in, in Galway, based in Arlen Moor. Um, I started off doing a, a marine biology um, degree in University College Swansea in Wales uh, as a mature student many years ago. Um, and after that, there wasn't an awful lot going. You know, it's quite a, a competitive area and during the 80s. It was, wasn't great work. So I uh, did a bit of work, saved up. Uh, um, after about six months, I managed to fund um, uh, participation in a project in the Philippines on fisheries genetics, which was my main interest at the time, just to try and get the CV taken over. Um, and from that, ended up doing an aquaculture master's in, in Cork um, and then went via inland fisheries for about four or five years back to back to here in the Marine Institute starting back in in 2000. So that's been my kind of convoluted career to this to this point. <laughs> Swansea to the Philippines to <laughs> back to Yes, yeah, great T-shirt collection. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very good. Um, we'll jump to you, Caroline. Thanks, Dave. We'll come back to you in a second on that. But uh, Caroline, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself yes, in that regard? I'm not as exciting as Dave. Um, so I just I went to college in Galway in um, what was called UCG at the time and I did a marine science degree so I was one of the guinea pigs for the the first uh, course that came out and then I went on and did a PhD in biological oceanography where looking at uh, microscopic plants in the ocean and ones that um, produce toxins so I work with uh, over the years I've jumped from many different um, areas, starting out with uh, phytoplankton, which are the microscopic plants. And um, I've worked with loads of different people and with many different types of expertise and things like physical, chemical and biological oceanography, um, numerical and statistical modelers. I love working with those guys and uh, even satellite specialists, data managers. And uh, recently I even got to work with some social scientists. So um, we all work on different research projects and we pull together information on what we call essential ocean variables. And uh, our main purpose is to get, um, I suppose, a better understanding of what's going on in the ocean so that we can advise policymakers and other stakeholders. And um, I also go to sea every year on the Celtic Explorer, 
and I do the annual uh, ocean climate survey. So that's me. Lovely. That's that's not a, a short answer, Karen. That's a great answer. Um, a lot of different things there. We'll talk about phytoplankton and how that feeds into the work that guys are doing in a little while. And finally, Claire, um, if you want to tell us about your backstory, and I don't know if you remember, but we have a shared educational background. Yes, we do, actually. Sorry, I'm delighted you remembered. <laughs> Uh, so I'm a fisheries ecologist. Uh, I started in UCC. Uh, I started in applied ecology where I studied ecosystem, population dynamics and statistical analysis. Uh, and then I went off and got a master's in marine biology where I got my hands dirty, studied the practical side and the application of marine science. Uh, both were in UCC. Uh, and nowadays I, I work on a many different projects. I feel more like a detective than a biologist. Uh, I work on solving biological puzzles around health and productivity of our oceans, uh, piecing together lots of different information collected at sea, ports, labs, producing models uh, to help decisions for a sustainable future. I spent quite a, a lot of time at sea over the years, both commercial and research vessels. And that's Very it. good. Another good one. Um, so myself and Claire met in Cork um, doing that master's in marine biology. Claire is actually the real guinea pig. She did the first year of the course. and I did the second year and we met as one was started, one was finished kind of thing. So that's very good, guys. We both got a very lovely overview there of what everything's, what, what we're all doing. Um, so how does that transcend into when life at sea then, and what actually types of surveys you do and the day-to-days of getting on a research vessel? So we've got all this experience and we've done gone through different areas um, to get to sea. So maybe Dave, like what's a typical survey for you or what's your bread and butter survey kind of thing? Sorry, um, the technology okay. of mute buttons. Um, the the main survey I'm involved in is the Irish Ground Fish Survey, which is a, an internationally coordinated commercial trawl survey, really. Um, and the main purpose of that is because there's such a, a poor link between the size of a lot of commercial fish stocks, so between the size of the stock and the number of juvenile fish they produce in any one year, which really is, is what replaces the, the the fish that have taken that are taken you know from commercial fishing there's such a sort of a tenuous link between the size of the stock and 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 their reproductive success in any in any given year that we have to go out and actually physically sample that to get an idea of how successful spawning has been in that year and again because the small fish or the juvenile fish by the end of the year when we have to make or give management advice because they're still so small they don't show up in the commercial um fisheries data you know, they have to use large mesh nets. So we're allowed to use small mesh nets um, so we can go in and actually start sampling and get a kind of a physical hands-on view of, of how, how many fish are likely to be coming into the fishery next year, which allows us to, um, to be either optimistic or pessimistic on, on the management advice for the next, next number of years. So really that's, um, I suppose, the, the, the key thing that we get out of these surveys. So um, that's the main survey I do. I've been involved in, in a few other ones, some of the uh, underwater TV surveys for, you know, where we tow a camera across the, the seabed for prawns and um, a very short stint on a, an acoustic survey once <laughs> um, and a few other egg surveys and things like that. But essentially it's it's fisheries trawl surveys is what I do. Okay, very good. Um... Claire, as a fishery scientist, and just briefly, maybe you do more or less the same kind of surveys. Is there anything different from 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 what Dave does there? Or uh, all that I wanted to add to that was, um, it's a real collaboration. It's... Those fishery surveys, and um, we don't just look at the fish. It's a real collaboration between master seafarers, master gear technologists, uh, fishers with many many years experience and it's a combination of all those different skills and that's why i really love the surveys is that you get to bring together you know the culture of the fishery the skills and the scientists and we we don't uh, waste any time or resources out there in any way shape or form that we collect ecosystem data from top to bottom. So we collect sea surface temperature as we move, as we drop the net in the water. We also collect information on our, Dave actually heads up collecting information on our litter program. We also have biodiversity um, indexes as well of everything that we find. So the benthic organisms we come across um, and it, all that information together provides key tools that you know, quite often we don't even know how these are going to be used, but we create these long-term data sets to better inform ourselves in the future. 
Okay, very good. And my understanding of ecosystems is that all these fish and biodiversity, essentially, um, in the different levels through the food chains, starts at the bottom, which is phytoplankton, the little animals that potentially are animals and plants, I should say, Caroline is involved in counting, mapping, and how does that work, or how do you go to sea to do that, Caroline? Well, um, so I also work with, so mainly physical oceanographers and uh, chemists. Um, okay. in the, and so when we're out at sea, we use a lot of different types of instruments and sensors to measure things like the ocean temperature, the salinity, oxygen, and we use um, a CTD sensor package and this this instrument measures salinity and temperature and it's uh, attached to the winch wire and it goes all the way from the sea surface down to the seabed and this can take many hours like three hours for example to do a cast um, because some of our deep stations especially off the west coast of Ireland in the South Rockall Trough um, can be um, as far down as about three over three kilometers so it takes a while so then when the instrument is coming back up to the surface um it's surrounded by a rosette of bottles and we they have their lids open on the sur on the top and the bottom and we triggered these lids to close shut at specific depths so that the chemists and the biologists then have water samples that they can use to measure things like nutrients and oxygen and your little phytoplankton if you want as well in the ship's labs and um, this, uh, we also deploy an, um, autonomous vehicles, so they collect similar measurements to the CTD that I was telling you about there. Uh, for example, we have a glider, and that's like a little miniature plane that flies through the water. And we also have these floats called Argo floats that we deploy, and they're like... Um, uh, robotic cylinders and they float in the water and they dive every few days and they come back up and both the uh, glider and the um, the Argo floats um, use telemetry via satellite to send the data you know back to shore so they can be assimilated into models so we can have ocean models um, working in real time and giving forecasts um, uh, giving information you know, like things like sea safety along the coast and things like that and uh, harmful algal bloom warning systems depend on these models as well and um, the data that we collect at sea um, what we're doing um, for ocean climate work that we do with uh, international groups like ICES, uh, the uh, Intra oh, lads, you'll have to help me now. Fisheries here, the intergovernmental. Tell me, Claire. ICES, uh, is it? Yeah, ICES. The International, International Council, Council for Research of Sea. For exploration of the sea. Exploration oh, of the sea. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So um, we're building a time series um, so that we can assess the changes in the physical and biogeochemical um, properties of the ocean. And this then goes, we meet a group from all the countries around the North Atlantic. And together we bring all our data together to, to look and see what the state of the ocean is each year. So that's me done. Okay, so basically in many different ways, uh, using different vessels and technologies, we're looking at the health of the ocean. The guys are looking at fish and biodiversity. Um, Karen can look at uh, temperatures, we're using satellites, we're using aut automatic planes and all this. So we're, all this technology that we're using and all to, towards the health of the ocean. So we've gone through that technical side of things, but I suppose, well, how long is, any, is everybody at sea actually? I mean, do the surveys, I know some of them are different. Claire, how long do you spend at sea? What's the longest you've been yeah, at sea? Yeah, the, the longest I've ever done is 21 days. Um, and then that year I did three 20 day surveys for the macro leg um, and yeah. that, that was, it's actually a lot easier than you think. I mean, for the grand fish, typical surveys are about 10, 14 days. Uh, but once you get over the 10 days, you get into a rhythm and every day kind of gets quite easier. Um, and it's a nice community spirit on board. So the 20 days did fly. Okay, very good. How about you, Caroline? Uh, so I can be out at sea for anything from like one day survey saying, uh, go away bay for example uh two weeks generally we go out um, to do the ocean climate survey and then the longest i've been at sea is a month when we went and did the transatlantic um survey for go ship which is an international group like, again uh working on ocean climate okay very good dave i suppose your answer is yeah. similar or 
Uh, similar enough, I suppose the the survey, the main survey is six weeks, and traditionally I would I would have always done the six weeks, <clears throat> um, seven weeks I think the first year because we were doing other tests as well. But um, for the last number of years, yeah, we've we've kind of scaled it back and rotated people on a, on a roughly two week two week basis, you know. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, I'm saying my longest stint was 21 days, and it's like it depends yeah. on the vessel on all the things we're going to get to now. So the big question everyone wants to know, apparently from Flora, is do you ever get seasick? Claire, <laughs> I think you have told us that. Yes, unfortunately, and I just would like to take this live opportunity to point out that anyone who claims they never get seasick is lying. Lying. <laughs> lying. Everyone, even master fishers, will always. There's always once that you feel sick, and it's usually associated with them um, extreme tiredness. So if you're a bit run down, you're very busy at sea, or you're rushing to get to the boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and what I love is that everyone handles it differently. You know, like uh, some people say you eat bananas or they say crackers and peanut butter and it'll improve it. But the only thing that's consistent for sure is that it does always pass. And that within two to three days, uh, no matter how sick you feel, you will start to feel better. Um, and it's definitely worth the challenge. Caroline? Yeah, of course, I always, <laughs> I do. Yeah, especially in recent years, actually. Um, so I always take seasickness tablets at least 12 hours before we head out and set sail. And normally within 24 hours, I get my sea legs um, unless we hit some bad winter storms. Yeah, so yeah. I totally agree with you, Claire. There's no such thing as a person who doesn't get seasick. Um, Dave, you hardy old sea dog, you. Yeah, no, <laughs> never. <laughs> uh no uh yeah uh the odd time uh, you would feel a bit seasick i've only actually ever been sick uh once without getting into the details um on a commercial boat years ago yeah yeah but it, it is it is virtually unavoidable if you haven't been out for a while um the, the first couple of days you know you it's it's great for um great for the weight loss you do kind of scale back a bit on the solids you know i have to say but then you're you're back into it you know once you get a couple of nights sleep but it's, it's very much down to the individual. It's really surprising, you know, that we've had rugby lads out, you know, who you can tell play a lot of rugby and they're curled up in a ball on the couch in the corner. And, you know, what looks like the local librarian can come out and work with us as a student, you know, for a couple of so and they're absolutely fine. They're flying it. It's just, it's a, it is very much down to the individual and there's just no way of predicting, you know. But as Claire says, everybody gets over it, you know. Everyone gets over it. Um, I suppose what my mother always said was the best cure for seasickness is to go home and sit under a tree. A tree, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That aside, yeah, I suppose it would depend a good bit on the vessel you're in. So, I mean, that brings us to we have the Explorer and the Voyager in, in our fleet at the moment in the, the Marine Institute managed. Of course, there's other boats and there's, ve and there's commercial vessels we use, and the Tom Crean is coming. Do we have a preference for the Explorer, the Explorer or the Voyager? Have we got experience of both? Anybody want to jump in there? Yeah, it's, it's like first, there. it's like first class going back to economy. So <laughs> it's it's like you know, you have like the bigger the boat, the more luxurious it is, for sure. <laughs> Also, yeah. we can add that, you know, that the Explorer has things like a gym and, you know, TVs oh, nice. and your own bathroom. It, it yeah. really is. Uh, my parents used to feel sorry for me going to sea. They used to really, you know, take care of me. They'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Here, we packed some sweets, have a great trip. And then they saw the Explorer. And since then, they call it my floating holiday when I go to sea. <laughs> so you can't compare it to the Voyager. <laughs> I have a question here from the floor I'm going to throw up because I think it's relevant here now. Um, hopefully I can do this. Aaron is asking, how would you prepare to go to sea as an intern as I'm preparing to board the Explorer for the West Pass Lake 1 survey? So that's very good. I mean, so this is all about how we deal with this. Aaron, you may or may not get seasick, but what is he going to pack in his bag? What's he going to leave behind? These type of questions. Dave. Uh, <laughs> this is... Yeah, well, this this I guess comes up a lot. I mean, it's it, we always get asked this, and it's very hard to think of anything that isn't really catered for uh, at sea. I mean, it's a great opportunity to, even though it is it is connected now. Um, certainly, up to a few years ago, it was a great opportunity to try and leave a bit of the, the digital world behind. You know, bring bring that book that you've never managed to, you know, you've been trying to get through before you got your smartphone. Um, 
and try and disconnect a bit. Although there's, it is connected now, there's internet and everything. So you see people on their phones all the time, unfortunately, you know, so I always took it as a, as a great opportunity to do that. All the comforts are there. Um, so that there's nothing really in terms of comforts that, that you need. Um, just use it as a time to catch up with hobbies a bit. And, and you see all sorts, you know, I see, I, you know, I see students bringing out, you know, their favorite pajamas and hot water bottles and curling up on the couch and all that kind of thing. But so, but I, I can't think of anything really that you, that you're going to miss. Just enjoy it. Obviously, other than the, you know, the main, if you need boots and stuff for working on deck, but yeah, other, other than that, I, yeah, I wouldn't worry. Claire's just desperate to get in there. <laughs> First of all, stop telling people about my hot water bottle. <laughs> well, I, I, avoided the, I avoided the onesie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and secondly, I would just say to Aaron that it's it, not about preparing to go, but actually while you're there, there are some really experienced scientists on board. Use that opportunity to learn everything possible from, you know, speaking to the engineers, getting to know the boat, getting to know how we sample different equipment. On quiet surveys, you can spend the time getting to know those pieces of equipment and that is a really useful thing to have on a cv in the future yeah very good very good point there i would second that it's hard if you haven't been to sea before so this whole thing about sea legs and when you go to sea for the first time your legs are really tired you're tired you get seasick the first couple of days can be tough and you're supposed to be learning out there so keep yourself a few days to to ease into it but then once you get your sea legs once you get into your routine i mean take as much um time as you can to learn as much stuff as care so well said I'm going to move on to another question here, which is just the one that's popped up in front of me. Um, <laughs> uh, from Fenor National School, um, Claire might answer this, I think it's just in relation to someone she might know, has the water temperature increased around the Irish coast in recent years? And if so, by how much? Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to this class. They Their school is quite close to the sea and they're quite an active small group of individuals. Um, it has know. increased around our shores. Um, but I, maybe Caroline can jump in here. You might have a better idea exactly um, how much. I don't know. Well, exactly how much. I don't actually have it off the top of my head, but it has <clears throat> definitely increased. And we've worked with um, climate models that show that it is going to continue to increase. So it's something to watch for sure. And it's affecting the distribution of our fish stocks as well. So, for example, cod that you normally get in your fish and chips are a lot less common in our waters now. And they do believe that a, a driving feature of that is the temperature, that it's affecting their food availability. It's affecting their ability to reproduce. And um, so their distribution is shifting. Yeah, so it's a really good question. And why it's so important for us to be continuing this work into monitoring the ocean and be able to understand these variables and how they're changing over time because we won't be able to solve any issues or questions until we find out what's happening, which is why we go to sea in the first place. Um, there's one other question here from Johnny Gall, I believe. One second. No, I've lost it. So on to my next question. Oh, yeah, just I suppose a little nice catch all thing here. We all like going to sea. We've got different drivers. Oh, here's the question from Celine. Hi, Celine. We know Celine. Hello from Donegal. What's your favorite part of going to sea? And also, what was the greatest challenge you ever had? Caroline, what was the greatest challenge you ever had in a going to sea sense now, please? Not getting sick, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose uh, the biggest challenge for us is uh, we have a certain amount of time when we go to sea. You know, so we have a slot, say, of two weeks and we have to get all the work done. And you, if you're unfortunate with the weather, you can have a lot of downtime. So the CTD that we put in the water, you can't put it in if the uh, wave height is like higher than five meters. And so you need to heave two for a long period of time before, you know, once the storm passes then and everything settles, there's still, I suppose, a swell, but uh, uh, that would be the biggest thing. And then trying to get all your work done with it, less time to do, you know, and that would be a big challenge. And then the other thing, I suppose I would say that's really important is that like you mind people that are out with you at sea and um, you know if somebody isn't appearing you take care of them if they are getting sick so I think that's the really the biggest challenge but uh, uh, other than that yeah I think we're pretty good we've got a really good vessel and we've got really good equipment we're very privileged actually to be honest compared to other countries you know yeah, we are. we've got fantastic infrastructure to be able to deliver this, this science um just quickly then guys i'm going to go to both of you then with um dave and uh, claire with the, the remaining questions greatest challenge and your favorite part of going to see 
Claire. A uh, greatest challenge for me was on commercial boats um, and learning how to communicate effectively with fishers. And I have to say thank you to the people in Tom Maurice who were always welcoming to me. I learned a lot on commercial boats and I gained a lot of experience and uh, it grew my knowledge as a fishery scientist. But you always have to be open to that opportunity and that can be the challenging bit, not being, uh, not being scared to hear the, you know, the difficult questions and to help them find the answers. Very good. Dave, yourself? Um, yeah, I guess similar to Claire, that it that can sometimes be the, the biggest challenge is you know, particularly working with people that, um, you know, obviously are, you know, have a lot of skin in the game, you know, working in fisheries, they have, you know, loans and mortgages and generations of, of trying to keep, um, you know, working in, in fisheries and kind of keep the whole thing going. Um, and there's very often, I think, a little bit of um, a misunderstanding, maybe, that that we're somehow involved in in the, the quotas and the size of the quota that each country gets, as opposed to really we're we're I suppose involved in estimating the size of the of the cake at the end of the year, and you can end up having crossed conversations because they're very much talking about the, the size of the slice that Ireland gets, and we're and we're talking about the size of the cake, and we think we're talking about the same thing, and you kind of forget that you know, that there's there's just that very subtle difference. Um, and it can sometimes take a bit of time to kind of to twig that and pull back and, and then just make that extra kind of qualification or clarification. And then things kind of start to fall into into place and you start talking about the same thing. So, so yeah, communication is, you know, even within a survey and, and certainly with, with the people that this really impacts on, um, I find it is key and really important and, 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 a, and a challenge as well. Okay, um, thank you. And just to follow up with some questions and to take questions from, from Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Um, what is the best thing about research at sea? Um, I'm going to put that to you, Caroline. I'm going to slightly rephrase it. I mean, what's your highlight for being at sea? Or what have you done? Why do you go to sea? There. Well, the best, thing, the best thing that I love about going to sea is that you're way offshore and away from the world and it's easy to focus on the work without any distractions like emails, even though we do get, we do have uh, Wi-Fi in, that, there, in the ship, but um, it's the bane of everyone's life. But it's lovely when you're, you're on a watch and you're just focusing on the work that you have to do and all you see out there is the ocean and sky and it's very grounding, you know. So it makes you feel very small and it's good for you actually to feel that way, I think. Um, and the other thing that I love about it is that if you're near shore and you get the opportunity uh, to do shelf surveys, uh, looking at Ireland from sea and the coastline is absolutely spectacular, especially yeah. when you get good weather, like, yeah. <laughs> so Amazing, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, um, what was I going to say there? Yeah, just to follow up on it, uh, I just want to briefly throw my top on sort of the best and the worst thing. Uh, like being on the Voyager, doing these, the Celtic Voyager, doing a 24 or a 12 hour shift at night time, it's really difficult. The sea might be up a little bit. The Voyager doesn't, doesn't roll, rolls a bit, doesn't handle as well as the Explorer, and you're feeling bad all night. You have to stay awake all night. But then it, it kind of subsides and the sun comes up and you get this marvelous sunrise off over the horizon. There's no one around, as you were saying, Caroline. The sky is all these beautiful colors. Anyway, grounding, as you said. So um, that's beautiful. That's why we go go to sea. And yes, the coastline of Ireland is beautiful. Um, being around Sleeve League and place like that, it's amazing. Um, does anyone want to wrap up with any final comments about things they'd like to say? Or maybe um, to recommend a career in marine science or to provide advice to anybody that is thinking about it. And just to bear in mind, we're, it's just, we're going to shut off now in about four or five minutes. We're going over time, but I don't think anyone's complaining yet. <laughs> I can jump in there if you like. Uh, if, if you are considering a career in marine science, uh, learn to code and to communicate. Uh, having a passion for the marine environment and adventure, that's the easy bit. I think we could all pick that up thanks to David Attenborough and everyone else. But if you really want to have an impactful career, you know, make sure you learn how to code so that you can effectively create tools to apply to your science and, and learn to communicate so you can share your story effectively and bring together everyone. So there's a bit of work involved, that's what you're saying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Scientists, yeah. we don't make the best communicators ever. So that can that can be the tough bit, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, very good. Excellent. Caroline, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'd say um there's a place for everyone, no matter what your interest is. 
So anything from maths, chemistry, you don't just have to be a coder. Uh, biology, mapping, anything. We even I even work with economists and we've even had artists out at sea with us. So um, the other bonus about going to sea is if you're a Star Wars fan, you might get to see the Skellig Rocks and you're always guaranteed to meet lots of amazing people and plenty of characters and you're going to learn at least one new thing a day. Very good. Dave? Yeah, uh, we'll just uh, finally re reiterate what the others have said, but there, there is a huge spectrum, you know, just like once you once you put the sort of the um the, the banner of marine on top of things it goes from you know really multidisciplinary uh topics and and issues i mean if you if you want to go to sea uh, and sample from the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean you know you're talking about approximately you know 11 kilometers depth and um, so if you put a sensor down there it's got essentially you know 11,000 tons of pressure above it i mean there's huge that can be huge practical um issues involved in not only getting your little box of electronics together to go down and, and do that monitoring but you know actually getting it back and, and i've seen plenty of people standing on the back deck with a little box of tricks pressing a button trying to retrieve their phd and nothing's happening you know and um, so you go from the, the real applied immersive full contact science to other people that really spend a career you know behind a laptop um, as uh, you know, as Claire says, coding and getting into really high level modeling, even compared to, you know, climatology and stuff. I mean, you've probably a better chance of predicting the weather at this time this next year than you do of predicting the size of a fish stock, you know, when you when you start taking recruitment and stuff into it. So there's there's really, you know, deep dive modeling right through to, you know, a lot of applied sampling going to sea and really practical, difficult problems, you know, depending on, on where you so it's just a matter of you know trying to get stuck in get a little bit of experience see you know which which area you might suit, might suit you best and and then talking to those people and working out um you know wh where your your strengths might be where it's going because um the, the whole the programming end of it has only really come in in the last you know five six years it, it didn't exist really when i started only you know 20 years ago um and the colleges are very often playing catch up that you know the curriculum isn't always keeping up to pace so there's a real niche there if you can get to see and see what's happening and um, then you can really start to you know improve your own skills and uh, get a foot in the door and see how you can you know get it get a step up so yeah um thanks and i suppose just to follow up i just want to say like i mean if you some people did it, it's not all about research at sea either it's not all about going to sea you can be a marine scientist sitting in, in an office here in Galway, so a lot of students and other people try and get into it and maybe they go to sea and they don't like it they get seasick and they get put off from going to sea and that's all right that shouldn't turn you off the career itself um okay you can't go to sea but as i said you can do plenty of work most of the work happens in the office so the guys go out and get the data at sea using all their their, their methods and their technologies and they bring it back but most of the number crunching goes on back here um at, at dry and dry land so don't worry if you go to sea a couple of times and don't like it or can't do it um it's not the be all and end all of it um so that's what I would say to anybody who's looking into a, um, a career in marine science. And just, I did a quick look today at some of the courses that are available in Ireland if people are interested in pursuing this. Um, you know, maths, biology, chemistry, these are the type of things you might do when you're leaving cert, but you don't necessarily have to have all of them. But there is by, um, bachelor's courses in, in Galway, in NUIG and GMIT, and there's master's courses in Cork, Claire did one, and there's different ones in GMIT as well. So there's routes into it in Ireland. There's plenty of routes into it um, in uh, other European countries. So there's some things you might consider. And of course, if you have any questions about getting involved in the Marine, don't hesitate to contact me or indeed any of these guys here on this call or the Marine Institute, and we'll do our very best to direct you. Okay, so um, guys, I think that's it. Are we happy? Have we said everything we wanted to say? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay, thanks. listen. Thanks for having us. I'll just throw yeah. in a last last vote for the Voyager. I, I too spent a bit of time on the Voyager and there's a lot to be said for those small boats. They can they keep you off the main email traffic. <laughs> um yeah. So when you're running surveys, it's nice to be a little bit anonymous on the smaller boats. The big flagships are great, they're very comfortable, but they generate a lot of interest, you know, a lot of email traffic. <laughs> And we'll say goodbye to the voyage now because it's been decommissioned in the next couple of weeks um it's been in service since 1997 it was the primary research vessel then the explorer came along it served its time and done a magnificent job all around the country um it's been decommissioned and we welcome the tom crane which is coming in in a couple of weeks or a month depending on on lead lines we're very excited and all i'm sure looking forward to getting on that but that's another conversation um so guys listen thanks very much dave stokes fishery scientist Claire, um, fishery scientist, 
Thanks very much for being with us. And Caroline Cusick, a biological oceanographer, if you don't mind. <laughs> so, lads, um, thanks very much for being with us today. Um, we've had a lovely time here. Again, hashtag World Ocean Day, all that business. So, bye, Dave, Claire, and Caroline. And okay, okay. goodbye from me. So, I'm going to see you all at sea. See you at sea, guys. Bye, bye. End broadcast.